They call it the theatre of war. It's a true thing. Unless you've actually been to one and hear the noise and the smell and the, and the, and the anguish on civilians' faces, it, you know, it's hard to explain that unless you've been to one of those things. When you start off in your career, you have a little checklist in your mind of the things you want to do and achieve. And to me, you know, 25 years of the ABC, working all those bureaus, eight years at 60 Minutes, um, 110 countries, uh, you know, I've been kidnapped, arrested by the KGB, stoned, punched, you know, um, attacked, shot at. There, there are things we see that no one, no, no civilian sees. I mean, we see in our job from people who have lost everything to presidents and kings and queens and everything in between. No other job really does that. We go to the airport with our 11 cases or 12 cases with the four corner stickers on them, on the case, and everyone's saying, oh, four corners. You know, we felt very, very proud. You'd all land at the airport and the carousels are just burgeoning with silver road cases and pelican cases. Batteries and phones and tripods and lights and more batteries and um, transcoders and so just massive, massive amounts of equipment. The gear that I took uh, going into places like uh, when I was crossing illegally into Zimbabwe when journalists weren't allowed in, I had camera gear that I broke apart and that I could spread throughout a bag. I had hidden cameras that were inside a backpack and so the lens was in the strap of the backpack and I could pull apart stuff so that hopefully they wouldn't, when they open the bag, they might see a small camera, they might see a backpack that they don't necessarily put two and two together. I used to pack my equipment as if I was a tourist and no pelican cases, no silver boxes, nothing like this. It had to look like it was a suitcase with lots of, you know, stickers on it that says, you know, vacation in Hawaii or whatever. In Zimbabwe, I had crossed over um, and going in then, I had worked out, I had been doing it a few times, so um, I knew the way to get in, which border to cross at that uh, wasn't computerised, so um, that it was safe for me to get across, that my name wouldn't pop up, and in any way they couldn't search my name, and so they wouldn't know I was a journalist. And then it's a matter of uh, finding a, a fixer and a driver, because we don't speak the language, so we need someone to interpret to us. Wait, they're going to go out and speak to him, see if they're yeah. happy if we can, uh, yeah, we can shoot. They were just worth their weight in gold because they they saved your bacon. They they eased the way. They they knew where to go. They could get you through things and past those roadblocks. What come from? Australia. Australia. We rocked up at the border there and basically we um, uh, we just drove straight in there and we passed the Americans at the airport. So we were in Kuwait City while the uh, Iraqi soldiers were still fleeing. We were the, the only Australian journalist and cameraman to be embedded with the first Marine Expeditionary Force um, to go into uh, Iraq. Four Corners shot film until about 94. Uh, so certainly when I was there, before I went to foreign correspondent, uh, it was all film. And you, you literally used to tape up two eskies you know, for an overseas trip. I think you used to fit 30 cans um, in each esky. And of course the weight of film on your back in a 
the BL camera was a very heavy camera. Um, it was difficult. Now and then we, we, we shipped it back and you'd take a bag which said ABC News on it or whatever and you'd wrap it all up and take it to the airport and hope for the best it got back to Sydney and you hear two or three days later it, it arrived. And that in many ways defined your relationship and your identity as a current affairs cameraman because people couldn't see the footage. No one knew exactly exactly what it was you got until they were back in Sydney and you know, through the lab and out the other side. There was no satellites. We didn't have any mobile phones or um, computers. So they hadn't been invented. It was the early 90s and uh, we had uh, we had a beta cam SP, I think, you know, videotape camera, which was brand new back in those days. Which we thought were just fantastic because they weren't um, connected to anything. So you just had it on your shoulder and we didn't, we were young and we didn't care about the weight. You had a flyaway dish and it was set up where the story was, where all the journos were so everyone could feed from there. You've got to get there first before CNN gets it or we got to get it and just to get it on air by the satellite or wherever or through the phone to beat the competition. Uh, there was always a problem, you know, where's the problem? There was always a problem that, you know, Sydney would be saying, you'd be on the phone going, OK, we're just rolling it now, Sydney, what are you, what are you seeing? We can see Geneva. We can see Geneva. We can see the line from Geneva. We can see the colour bars, but we can't see Zagreb. So somewhere along the line it got lost. So that was always, there was always something going wrong. And, but you always seemed to make it. But we had seen um, new technology arriving late in 2002, which was loosely called store and forward. And we could film a piece to camera and an interview and some overlay of, um, of the scene. And as long as I edited it down to a very short package, maybe three or four minutes, very tight, and then put it into the computer and really compressed it, um, I could then send that um, via the satellite phone. And it would take, you know, that three or four minutes would take about three or four hours to, to arrive back in Sydney. But the real advantage was that it meant we were untethered from that satellite uplink, from that feed point. From film to electronics to now an SLR camera that every Tom, Dick and Harry can go around, but also your, your mobile phone these days. Wow. But now they're expecting a cameraman, a cinematographer, to do everything. And I was a rare person, I guess, at that time, that I was a journalist and a camera operator and technically adept as well. So I could, I could film, I could edit, I could send it back. At the end of the day, I feel people like me uh, are going to disappear. They'll become VJs. The immediacy of news today dictates that you have to be a video journalist to be able to keep up with the demand of continuous rolling news coverage. I, for one, would never diss video journalists because I am one. Um, but I also think you just bring different skills, a different approach, and um, you go different places. But there will always be a need for high-quality images and storytelling, and that's where, you know, good camera operators come into their own. I'm under no illusions of I, with a small camera, for the most part, can't do what people with big cameras can do. But what I can do that's very different is up close and personal with someone. I can make someone much more relaxed in with a small camera. I can spend more time with them. I can get a different story altogether. When I was in Afghanistan, I um, mean, I got to cover stories. I could talk to both men and women. You know, the guys who went in, you, they didn't get an entree into the lives of women. It was a closed off society. When you're looking through that viewfinder and covering a scene, I always found I had this weird separation. You're not really part of that scene. Your job is to film it and your eye is on the viewfinder and you're just trying to keep everything, the story in frame. And we've all, we all know this and it's been said a lot of times that the uh, 
the camera can give you a false security by looking through that lens. Putting your eye up to the camera, it just becomes another scene. Um, and you lose sight of what you're actually filming because it's like a movie. But you sort of didn't feel like you were there. It did feel like you were just watching it on telly. And it gave you this sort of sense that, well, nothing can happen to you because I'm not really here. I'm usually so um, busy concentrating on, you know, framing and reacting to the shot, um, focus, exposure. There's like 10 different little variables that you have to think about just filming. There isn't a, dis a dissociation. Anyway, whether or not it's with, you know, an emotional family moment of someone else's tragedy or, you know, there is a level of distance. The thing about it is most of your career and most of the things that you've filmed, you've seen through this little one and a half inch square black and white screen. Shooting with the camera that I used at the time and pretty much all of the cameras that I use, um, your eye isn't necessarily always up to the viewfinder. It is sometimes, but sometimes you're looking at the screen. So you, you're possibly taking in more than people who are just looking through the viewfinder. It's not something you see on TV. You're actually living this, you're watching it, you're watching it unfold in front of you and it can go horribly, horribly wrong so very quickly. We weren't the targets, we were the obvious, we were the observers, we were the bystanders, so we weren't targeted. Um, and that's very different to, I think, to a, a lot of conflicts today. This is incredibly dangerous work. I think it's more dangerous now than it's ever been, being a, a war correspondent, a war cinematographer. The, the rumour came around that um, there was a $1,000 US bounty on knocking off a foreign foreign press person. They started targeting us and then they started using us as money raisers, you know, because it was a million bucks. You know, take someone hostage, get a million bucks out of, out of the network, hand them back, and if they didn't hand over the money, well, cut their throat. That sort of changed a little the way we did it because up until then you would, you'd get a van, you'd tape it up with, you know, Australia TV across it. You'd have press, you know, across your T-shirt or on your uh, body armour. Wearing flak jackets is, is a bit of a punish, you know. It's so hot and it's so hard to move and it's hard to get, keep the camera on your shoulder, but, geez, when you need them, you need them. Whenever we cover conflict zones, we basically have a 15-minute rule. You've got five minutes of, of being on the ground where people are curious and inquisitive about who you are and what you're doing there. You've got five minutes on the ground that people are now trying to work out where you're from and what you're doing there. And during that time, they make phone calls and they send off for the bad people to come. And then in the last five minutes, that's when the bad people have been dispatched to come and get you. So you get yourself out of that situation. And we had an agreement, a pact, that if any of us felt that it was too risky to go somewhere. It just had to be one person and we, we wouldn't go. And then all of a sudden he starts popping off rounds. So everyone dives on the ground. I was sort of left in the open, but as I jumped over a, a, a cement um, barricade, I sort of landed on like a, a carpet of journalists. So I'm just sort of stomping on journalists to get to basically get cover. Journos and crew's relationship, it's, it's the most important thing. It's, it's the basis, it's the foundation on which the whole story is built. I'm pretty much best friends with most of the correspondents I've ever worked with. Uh, we get on really well, you have to be like a team. You've got to be mates. You've got to be trusting. But if there's miscommunication, um, within within that group, or within those two people, then it can be fraught. A lot of younger journalists who want to be correspondents 
often think that by placing themselves in harm's way, that's going to elevate and escalate their career aspirations. But in a lot of ways, it's not a, it's not a real good look, especially if you end up injured or dead. I think Ukraine in Russia and um, say, um, say in China, you know, when, when they point a gun at you, then, you know, you know you're, okay, you're, you mean business. Is it worth it? Is it worth your life or even to lose an arm for this pressure that's on, on people now to cover, to cover wars? As I'm filming like this, uh, I hear Trevor say, Louis, 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 put the camera down, put the camera down. I turn around and there's this Humvee with its turret pointed straight at us. And I went, oh, Dave, this is not good. And, and by then, uh, they were getting targeted, the, the Marines, and I thought, okay. So I closed my eyes and I thought, oh, it's over. But they didn't pull the trigger. I was doing a story that was focusing on the human shields movement. Um, people who thought they'd come from all around the world to stand in front of tanks to, in the belief that they could make a difference and um, stand up for the Palestinians against Israel in, in effect. And this Irish woman and um, her Indian mate were walking towards a, an Israeli tank because they were saying that the soldiers were preventing children coming home from school. They were shooting at them. What would your mother say if she could see you shooting children? But I had a tripod and a small camera, all things I know now I should not have done. And I'm standing in the street, and what I didn't realise, that behind me, Hamas had suddenly come out of nowhere. Next thing, the, the tank fires a shot over my head, um, and it was like, yeah, I'm out of here. I actually had a small Sony Handycam. It was the latest one, but tiny. And I would just slip that down into my underpants and go to where the action was, pull it out, shoot, put it back in again, and go, that was it. That's no shorts, thongs, look like just another person. There's a million ways to get tapes out in a conflict. Sometimes you have to be really uh, experimental. On my pair of thongs, which I was walking around in, I got a razor blade and cut a hole, just a slither into the, into the rubber to put in the SD cards there so I could actually walk out, walk the material out. You've got to think of ways around, you know, you've got to dub stuff. You've got to have multiple, you know, multiple copies, whether or not you put it in the mail, whether or not you put it in your thongs, whether or not you carry it with you, you know, or hand it to someone else. I started taking the tapes apart, pulling the cassette apart, taking the roll of tape out of it, and then you could easily disguise that in something else. You have to plan with these sorts of things. It's good to get the footage, but then you've got to make sure that you get it out and it's shown, because otherwise it's a complete waste of time for everyone who's been involved in trying to tell the story. I basically hired a horse, put all my gear on the horse, jumped on the horse and rode out over the Hindu Kush, back, over, back out over the top and got out of Afghanistan that way. Yeah, those things are fun. Those things are really, you feel sort of spy, you know, it's sort of... You know, it gets you going, and that is addictive. I don't think I've ever put the camera down. I've been asked to put the camera down, and I'll just keep rolling, but kind of pretend I'm not rolling, just like take your eye of the viewfinder and yeah, 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 yeah. I put the camera down at the point of a gun when you're told to, because that's just survival. Um, I may or may not have still been filming, but I've done that. If I, you know, if I stop at every, when I feel uncomfortable or a little bit, you know, then what am I doing? I'm, I'm shortchanging that person in a way because they, they, people deserve to know or should know what's happening. I don't think there's been an occasion where I've put the camera down and, you know, intervened in, in any way. Um, I've always thought it was my job to record the scene. There's a man on a pile of rubble and there was some smoke. And I, I filmed Jim, I got a close up of his face. And I went to leave, I turned around, I put the camera down and I went up to him and uh, I, gave him a, I gave him a hug. I punched a few people in, in, in the course of my work. I had to fight in East Timor to get my camera back. We were travelling along the road and below it um, was knocked out tanks. 
One of the drivers had jumped out of the vehicle and he rolled down the hill, we imagine, and the tank rolled over him and it stopped and it was lying on his belly. So I got out to film this scene, horrific scene, and I could hear Allah Allah, but he was stuck under the tank. The tank was stationary on him. And I'll never forget his face, and he was begging for water. We gave him water, and he just wanted to hold my hand, and there was no way we were gonna get him out of there. So the officer just turned to me, Israeli officer, just turned to me and said, go back to the car. And I just heard one shot. We were filming and then we got word that three young kids had found anti-personnel mines. They'd been washed down a creek and they were hanging in a tree and they'd gone and played with them. And they got blown to bits, right? They were alive, but they were in terrible shape. And so we went to the hospital and the parents couldn't be found and and so we're filming one of the kids who passed away, but the other one could, was alive, you know, and could be saved. And um, I filmed, and then I said, look, you know, um, I said, are you gonna give him a blood transfusion? And it turned out there was no blood. The doctors had sold it all on the black market. You know, and it was just heartbreaking, and this kid is, dying in front of you and I turned the camera off and said you know I'm O plus you know and we've got a blood transfusion kit in the car you know hook me up you know let's save this kid and just then the auntie turned up and you know and the translator saying you know the cameraman you know he's got a kit and you know he can this is Cambodia and she said tell him thanks Thank him very much, but not to bother. He's crippled, he's no use, let him die. If you choose to take on this work and you choose to do it for a long period of time, it is going to have an effect. I think this is when I really started to get into the, the adrenaline of, of doing this sort of work because it was exciting, it really was exciting. And, and that becomes addictive because you want to, you do want the respect of your peers. You do want to be seen as someone who's out there uh, on the front line. Now, I can't say whether the job does that to you or you have a specific personality that wants that. Later in life, they can, they can, you can sort of start to think about it. And you start to, especially when, if, especially if you're, highly strung or you love the excitement or you love the adventure part, when that stops and how to manage that, it's, it's, it's basically hurt locker stuff. The one thing I really hate is, you know, people saying, oh, you're a war correspondent, tell me the most dangerous thing you ever did. Tell me the most scariest thing you ever did. But people wanting, like, disaster porn. I'm not gonna tell, like, sorry, those stories are really tough. They're really personal. They were real people. They are real people. And I'm not just going to give you a quick hit story to make you feel good um, that you can say, oh, I've spoken to her and she told me this. It hits you sometimes, just those things that it builds up in your body and you think, I don't know how much more of this I can take. You do pay. You look back at in my case, in my life, you do pay, you do pay, you do pay a heavy price. You know, you can compartmentalise all you like, and, and that works, but some, somewhere along the line, something's going to just set you off. Look, I'm asked this a lot, um, and, you know, my easy answer is simply say, you are the sum of your experiences. And, look, that's a glib throwaway line that basically keeps most people happy, and you just don't have to talk about it. Being captured always played on my mind. I couldn't stay in close confinements. Even on helicopter, even on planes, I couldn't sit. I had to sit always on the aisle. Even happens now. If I can't get an aisle seat, I won't go, because I know it's had to have an effect on me. With some people, it sticks, and uh, they find it hard to. Um, particularly, you know, when um, uh, children are involved. You know, you see kids dying or um, um, uh, massacres, that sort of stuff. It will 
make it very difficult for your partners to to deal with you. And of course, my marriage broke down and, and I wasn't the nicest person to live with after that. I think just things, war after war, um, had built up. That's really hard. It's hard for the wives and um, partners to, to be at home and, you know, just try and carry on and try and carry on with life because to a large extent it's easier when you're away. I've taken myself off to see um, psychologists because there was a time when I could not stop crying driving into work. Um, I get so far and I just couldn't stop and I didn't know where it was coming from. In this age of PTSD and acknowledging trauma and conflict um, exposure and stuff like that, in my day ne that never happened. The counselling that we used to get was basically going to the bar and having a chat afterwards and debriefing your day that way. Maybe at the end of the day we're going to have a beer and we have a little bit of, uh, use a little bit of black humour to kind of cope with it. And the horrible things, you just talk it out, you know, you just you just talk about it, have a few drinks, everyone had a story to tell and, and you just, you know, you'd put that one away. Being in the media has, has opened a door into so many worlds that, you know, I get to have a look at but then take what I want from those worlds and that's been the greatest thing I you know I would you know I'd never regret it at all there was a time I wavered about whether we can you know you were committed to journalism because you believed you could make a difference there was a time I thought oh can you really did we was it a waste of time we were kidding ourselves for the most part stuff we do no one cares about but there is that moment that it does happen and so it's worth that and we did the right thing. We told the stories about you know, inequality or whatever or corruption and, we, and we, we took those scenes to the world. As traumatic as some of those incidents were, it has been an extraordinarily privileged 40 years of work.